Okay, um, we will kick off. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome again to Maximizing Philanthropic Impact in the Fight Against COVID-19. This is a webinar um, jointly brought to you by Gladstone Institute and Give to Asia. Um, we're really happy. Obviously, this is a topic everyone's talking about. Um, so this panel is timely. Um, my name is Deborah Khan. I am the moderator today. Um, I'm a journalist uh, based in both Hong Kong and San Francisco. Um, I was in Hong Kong uh, when in January um, when um, the um, COVID was uh, really um, transpiring in Wuhan. Um, Hong Kong took severe measures um, in order to prevent um, the spread of COVID. We had school canceled back in January um, only to fly to the US uh, to San Francisco on February 7th. Um, so I come with um, different perspectives um, on tackling this virus. And so it was with great pleasure that I am accepted um, the offer to moderate um, this, this discussion. So with that, um, we'll kick off. I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Akila Jogi. She's the Vice President of Family Philanthropy at Give to Asia. Um, as some of you may know, Give to Asia has done extraordinary things in mobilizing support um, on the ground in Wuhan, and we'll, we'll go into that um, in a bit. Um, and um, from Gladstone Institute, we have Melanie Ott. She is a senior investigator um, at Gladstone. I have to refer to my paper because what she's doing is so um, uh, interesting, but I don't want to mess it up. Um, she uses state-of-the-art organoids to model the infected human lung in a dish, and she um, helps scientists understand at a single cell level how uh, corona damages lung tissues and, and how to prevent that, this. So welcome, everyone. Um, I thought it most appropriate to start um, first with you, uh, Akila, and tell us a little bit about how um, Give to Asia reacted very quickly in, in China. So tell us exactly uh, what transpired. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, there we go, we're in the full screen right now. Uh, I'll give you a quick background on to Give to Asia for those who don't know very much about us. We were founded about 20 years ago with a mission to strengthen communities across Asia. And the primary purpose uh, in the way that we do this is we build relationships with international donors here in the United States and connect them with in-country projects in Asia. Uh, we're one of the leading advised grant making groups in Asia today and we primarily partner with private donors. So we're working with individuals, families, uh, private foundations, community foundations, corporate foundations who are all seeking to give back to local organizations in Asia. We make about 30 million dollars in grants every year and usually it's a wide range of um, service areas that we support. Um, but when it comes to disaster response programs, it's a small part of what we do, but we've been doing it for a number of years. Uh, Give to Asia's experience with the COVID-19 coronavirus started in January, which uh, was quite earlier on in the year. We were one of the first organizations to begin fundraising and supporting projects in Wuhan. And we launched a fundraising campaign um, January 23rd, right around the time when it became clear that Wuhan was becoming a, a crisis. Within two days, we received confirmation from Chinese authorities that they would be giving us 48 hour approval process to get funding to local communities, which is really fast. For, for China, usually it takes about two to three months to get funding into local communities, but a 48 hour was really important and critical, especially in this crisis mode. Um, and we started supporting projects after we sourced them, sourced the needs with the uh, communities and local com nonprofit organizations. The two primary needs that we focused on were one, supporting frontline health workers um, and increasing the capacity of patient care in locations where medical care was just stretched. Um, and it was it was a whirlwind, um, Deborah. The starting January, you know, and February and March has just been a flood of 
on one hand, donors reaching out to us, asking questions about how they can support and really wanting to support and wanting to understand how they can help communities. And then on the other hand, our teams uh, in Beijing just being inundated by needs on the ground, uh, nonprofit organizations reaching out to them saying, we really need you know, protective gear. We need machines for our hospitals. And then just the phase so, started spreading out. What, so China was really, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see um, as, as this virus cycles through countries that, you know, much of the problems on the ground are the same. Um, so when you were getting those calls, um, what did you identify as the most critical areas uh, that where you really needed to get support in? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, in the beginning, it was just a flood. Uh, and we noticed there was three phases. So the first phase was just containing the virus. Everyone was just trying to figure out how do we contain this virus. A lot of the funding in the first phase, the first two weeks, was going towards um, obtaining personal protective equipment for frontline health workers. We're seeing that here in New York as well. People saying they need masks, they need uh, gowns, they need gloves. There was just a scarcity for all of that. And then we started hearing hospitals reaching out saying, we need ventilators, uh, we need disinfectants, we need blood analysis equipments, oxygen machines. And it was really hard to find them because- I was gonna say, how did you find those things? I mean, today we're reading in the papers what New York's going through too. So where, where did they come from? Yeah, uh, overnight, and this was a challenge. It really was, if I'm being honest. It was a challenge because all of a sudden, nonprofits are going from being service delivery folks to really understanding complex medical needs and logistics and sourcing, like things that we as nonprofits haven't had very much experience with. But fortunately, we had local teams on the grounds and local nonprofits that were able to um, identify a, a few um, machines that were really helpful. So we were able to get donations from here in the US and purchase, uh, I would say, I think it was about 120 different ventilators, oxygen generators, blood analysis machines, um, air purifiers for hospitals and start dispersing it to key hospitals that were just getting a flood of patients. So that was the first flood. Um, and then we started seeing it evolve a little bit we started hearing um, the needs were around filling gaps, social service gaps. So um, one thing that was uh, key, which I think is different here in the United States, but in Wuhan, they had one epicenter and all the medical uh, professionals just came in from all around the country to Wuhan, which is great. But what ended up happening is these frontline health workers were traveling all across China to support Wuhan. They were working extremely long hours. Uh, they were often staying at or close to the hospitals because they either couldn't go back or didn't want to go back. So they didn't want to infect their family family members. Um, and they needed, they needed to figure out how to eat and where to eat and where to live. And so a lot of the funding went towards providing meals and lodging and care for frontline health workers. Once that subsided, we started noticing that there was this whole population of folks in Wuhan that needed to be at a hospital, but couldn't be at a hospital. So these are people that had all these other issues besides COVID-19 that would typically have been in a hospital. Um, so uh, we started working with more community-based organizations to provide um, home care, meals, uh, uh, basic necessities for folks that have lost wages, uh, and, and the needs started evolving into that. And now we're in the third phase, uh, which we're hoping is the final phase, but it's around recovery and social and economic stabilization, trying to figure out how we can provide psychosocial support to frontline health workers who face very traumatic three months. Uh, how do we provide economic recovery to support the unemployed and those who've lost a lot of earnings over the past three months while they've been in quarantine? It's, it's really amazing to see the collaboration, actually, that took place with, you know, the fundraising and then how you got it. I mean, and anyone, you know, I mean, as a journalist in Asia, I know how hard it is to really organize on the ground in China. So 
key to that success is obviously the partnerships you had um, with other um, NGOs. Um, so one of the things that I loved um, before we started this panel, um, when we were having a discussion, um, what I loved was, you know, we hear so much in the press. Um, it, this, this, this topic, um, in all honesty, has become very politicized. Um, but when you look at what's going on on the ground and the level of collaboration, um, both with philanthropy and with science, um, which is going to bring us to Melanie. Um, I, I think it's 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 really inspiring, actually, um, the collaboration between the scientists. So, Melanie, um, we're going to talk about how you're working on Corona, but before we do that, um, I'd like to talk to you about what the collaboration with the Chinese scientists on the ground. Um, what types of things were you learning? Um, were you getting data from them? Um, how did you, I mean, obviously China was, uh, is ahead in terms of their experiences with COVID-19. So what, from San Francisco, what types of information were you getting out of China? Well, I'm, I must say that the, um, the level of collaboration currently in the scientific field is really unprecedented and that does not, you know, stop at any borders or any continents. I think this is going across the whole world because we're all affected by it. And Wuhan and China has a huge advantage now because they are far ahead uh, from us and so we can learn a lot from them and Chinese scientists have you know, very actively um, published, you know, the sequence of the virus, but then also all their scientific and medical experience um, with the virus um, on, you know, um, preprint servers that are, all, that are freely accessible for everybody. Um, and that does not pose any hurdles to review or whatever. Um, so there's, there's an immediate publication and that has been an amazing um, vehicle for everybody in the world to learn what is what is really going on, um, even if it's only a case or a, a small discovery or a small piece of the puzzle, I think everything is going to be put out for the public and for the scientists in other countries to learn. So tell us a little bit about the organization, like so for example with your research, your focus, um, how did, how did you, I mean, it, 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 in a virus, there's so much to study, especially when it's spreading so rapidly and it's a race against time. How did you decide to, to really replicate lung tissue and understand how the virus, you know, how to prevent um, the destruction of lung? Why, why that area? Why was that natural to you to pick? Very, very good question. Um, so the Gladstone Institute really has a very long-standing interest we, in, in virology. We have been at the forefront of the HIV epidemic 20 plus years ago, and, um, and we are now um, shifting considerable resources to this pandemic, which is, seems to be as important uh, and big and um, you know, um, challenging for, for everybody um, as, as, as it was for the HIV crisis. So I think for us, it was naturally to get involved. For me personally, um, I think it was natural because we had a, a few years back, we started to um, invest in these um, more advanced cell models. Um, these are mini, mini organs in a dish that are more complicated to grow, but that we realized would give us better answers to our questions, especially in human models. So a lot of a lot of the biology and the therapeutics are tested in animals, but often these studies don't translate very well into success in humans. And so um, we invested very heavily into um, building better models in, 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 in humans. Um, and these organoids are, is, is one model that uh, that is very promising. And so we had several of these organoids um, running in the lab, including lung organoids that we used for influenza studies. Um, and um, and so we, for us, it was a natural um, shift uh, to to now use the knowledge that we have gained with these lung organoids and other infections like influenza to study the new um, coronavirus. I think it's important, um, and I think everybody in the field is currently trying to leverage whatever expertise they have um, to to make things happen immediately and and not in the mid or in the long term. Uh, because everybody realizes that um, now we, we have to find something now and not in, in two years. 
So as a virologist on, um, you know, and, and I've heard this question asked to many people, but, you know, you've studied um, different viruses and um, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, how, how complicated, how concerned are you with this one um, from what you know so far? Well, it is a very interesting virus, um, different from other viruses that I have worked with before. And kudos to my colleagues in the coronavirus field who have invested long term into this field because, um, you know, in, in, in research, there's often a coming and going. And SARS was very important a few years back, but then disappeared and then also funding dried out. And that's why many of the promising leads that have been developed at that time were actually not uh, pursued and and put into and put into place. So I think we learned that uh, coronaviruses are really a group of viruses that are very important to study. Um, we know you know SARS and MERS research, but we also know that we have you know common cold coronaviruses circulating. Um, these are also very been looked at very closely currently. Um, so that we can deduct whatever has been studied in them to the new coronavirus and see how we can, uh, you know, um, you know, exploit these data to the best of the current pandemic so that we can learn and be ahead of the virus without doing all the painstaking slow work that needs to be done. So there is a lot of help in this area. Um, it is a, a very big virus. It has a lot of components, which, um, which makes it um, interesting, but also a little bit more complicated to work with. Um, and I think as we go, we learn how we um, how we can tackle this from the virology side. But an important aspect, of course, is also to find out how we can tackle it from the immunology side. So is there immunity being generated? How can we boost this immunity? And how can we best test for this immunity? Okay, and I, I should say, I'm, I apologize, I should have said this at the beginning, that there is a Q&A function with this webinar, so please, um, to anyone listening, if you have questions during our discussion, um, please feel free to type it in. I think you're on mute, so I can't hear you. However, um, if you type the question in, I can read it and, and pose it to one of our panelists. Um, Melanie, I just wanted to pick up on, on something you said, because I've often covering, um, you know, being a journalist in Hong Kong and being very familiar and covering H5N1 and SARS, um, you know, we, we often think about these pandemics and we've been warned over and over again that something like this was going to happen. But it really, SARS kind of fell off the map. And is that because we were able to prevent it from becoming a global pandemic, that it really just fell off the radar of science? So in, in fact, human action almost because it was able to prevent the disease from spreading even further, it kind of dropped off um, off the radar. Is that fair to say? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting phenomenon that's very heavily looked into now because we want to learn and predict what the, the new coronavirus is doing, SARS-CoV-2. SARS um, and uh, and it's it's still not fully clear. I think there might be a, uh, you know many many different components coming together. Maybe the seasonality um, you know plays a role here of the virus. Um, maybe the virus mutated in an unfavorable way and um, and sort of put himself in or itself into a corner. Um, or um, there, it is just because the, the main difference between SARS-1 and SARS-2 is really the severity of the symptoms. So I think we're learning from SARS-2 that many people can remain asymptomatic or very low symptomatic, and that allows the virus to spread much easier um, than when you have an immediate severe disease where the host is not able to contact others to infect them. So um, there might be a, you know, a combination of many different uh, components here and it's still the the verdict is still out there what exactly happened to SARS. Yeah it is fascinating so um, Akila on the it's it's interesting to see um, the, the timetable of the virus cycling through the world um, and you know China um, schools are beginning to reopen in China um, life is resuming to um, you know much more it's much more normal than it used to be people are not um, under lockdown like they are in other parts of the world. So Akila, what, what is the, like, as you are working with your partners on the ground, you talked about this, that psychological impact. Could you um, tell us a little bit about where you see kind of the next phase in China um, 
where, where is the need? Um, you know, this is obviously there's not a cure for this um, at the moment. There's not a vaccine. Um, so what's the need in terms of prevention and making sure that this doesn't happen again? I think we're all grappling with that right now. And I think it's similar to what Melanie was saying. I think um, the Chinese are doing a really good job of sharing information. And we saw that during the crisis as well. My colleagues were sharing that the reason why people were able to mobilize was because they were open platforms of information. So um, the there was a, you know, a resource coordination platform where nonprofits were coming together, learning what resources were where so that they can organize really quickly. There was grassroots communication systems where folks can share their symptoms and they can have some sort of sharing group. There were folks that were sharing their needs and volunteers responding to that. And now the next phase is that they're sharing that information with everybody else in the world that's dealing with it, which is, I think it's great. And I think they need to continue doing that. We're seeing Chinese doctors traveling to countries with uh, weaker health systems and helping out in that way, which I applaud and I, I think it needs to continue. Um, but in China itself, um, I think there's going to be a great need for psychosocial support. These frontline health workers really were put through the ringer in the past three months. And um, there are a lot of cases where frontline health workers were disproportionately affected where they lost their lives and their families are left behind oftentimes uh, with very little resources. Their main breadwinner is no longer with them. And so we're learning from nonprofit organizations trying to figure out ways that we can support uh, the, the families that were affected, families of frontline health workers, but also others. And how do we really come together to stabilize the economy uh, is another big question. How, you know, how do we, how do we support the, the farmers whose productions and agriculture were totally disrupted? How do we help those who lost their daily wages uh, with three months of no salary? Uh, all of those questions are now things that we're pondering and trying to figure out. Yeah. You know, how can private donors step in? And what you point out is it's it's like even if you stem the infection and you bring you flatten the curb, um, there's still problems that exist on the ground. We have a question. Um, I think um, this one's at, uh, directed at you, Melanie. Could you elaborate on whether it's been possible to develop immunity based on cases seen so far? Yeah, I, I have to admit I'm confused about that too. Can you get this thing again, or um, once we get it, are we immune? Well, that's, that's the million dollar question currently. Um, I think we have examples from the existing coronaviruses where it goes either way, where you have long lasting immunity or not. I think the consensus pretty much is that yes, you will develop some form of immunity um, that, that will protect you immediately. The question is how long this will last, one year, three years, 30 years. Um, and I think this is, this is the big question that will also be important um, for the development of the vaccine, because if the virus itself is not a good immunogen to induce this immunity, then um, we have to be really creative with the vaccine to, um, to, uh, to achieve this. Is it, isn't it possible that, the, I, I remember when I was covering H5N1, everyone was scared. I mean, it was only animals to humans, but it would mutate and go human to human. So don't viruses just mutate? And is it possible this one could mutate and people who've had it could lose the immunity because it's not exactly the same virus? That's a very good thought. That's actually how it works when you don't develop neutralizing immunity against all the different species of virus that are around. Um, currently, this virus is not very mutagenic, so it's not uh, changing in dramatic ways. Um, but uh, but we, don't, we haven't really put any pressure on it also because we haven't really put a, an immune system in its way that it needs to uh, you know, circumvent. Same with the therapy. Um, so I think we will see in the future whether we have more selection of these mutant strains. Right now, there's not much selection out there in the community because not many people are immune against it. And, uh, and so um, it doesn't have a need to, um, to adapt. But, uh, but I think, yes, I think these are all very good questions and I think they will be answered in the future. I think the key for now is to um, A, find testing. Um, to both detect the virus, and that's a big issue, obviously, testing uh, currently in the U.S., 
um, and, um, and also find a test that can test the immune status so that we can at least see if somebody had been in contact and has developed at least some level of immunity um, that could make it or allow that person to go back to work or to become a health worker again at the forefront against the disease. You know, the testing topic is a really interesting one to me because I've seen two completely different scenarios living in Hong Kong and San Francisco. Um, you know, my doctor um, has kits in Hong Kong and they'll send them to your house and have someone come pick them up and carry them away. Um, that access is extraordinary and one you can't even imagine in the US right now. I mean, my sister had a bit of a cough and didn't want to go near my parents and has tried numerous times just to get tested so she could go near my parents who are elderly. That hasn't happened yet, you know? And so that type of access to tests, I mean, actually, let me, before we get to the next question, um, um, Akila, let me ask you that. Is, was testing an issue? I mean, could, could you get kits in China? Um, I mean, obviously we didn't have a hard time and we're not having a hard time in, in Hong Kong, um, but is that a focus for, for philanthropic money? Um, could perhaps philanthropy pick up on this and, and fill in the gaps with, with all of these missing testing kits? Yeah, so in China, it wasn't an issue. They were very, uh, very quick in, and able to test quickly. Um, and we saw that in, in country, you know, we're working in 23 different countries in uh, Give to Asia. And we, we've seen it, you know, spread, unfortunately. So we saw it, you know, go to Hong Kong, and we saw it in Taiwan and Singapore, and then now it's in like India and, you know, other countries. So we've been noticing the difference in how different countries are dealing with it, and then here in the United States as well. And those countries, you know, Taiwan, Singapore, China, Hong Kong, have been able to test so quickly, so rapidly in, mass, in massive amounts. But then the countries where we're not seeing the testing is where there's just a lot more ambiguity, a lot more questions and worries, and then the shutdowns. Uh, yeah. And that's what we're seeing here in the United States. But you know, India, a country of 1.8 billion people, is shut down for 21 days starting Monday. Uh, we're going to be seeing that in Vietnam, Cambodia, Nepal, Bangladesh. Uh, so tests are really important and I think private donors have a place to play there. Um, you know, supporting folks like Gladstone, but anybody else who's able to get rapid testing out there uh, and help the country get tested is important. Yeah. Um, the next question is um, to you, Melanie, saying, scientifically speaking, at what point is a viral pandemic considered to be over? That's a good question because I really can't even see the light at the end of the tunnel at this point. Yeah, I think, I, well, I think this is, uh, I think this is when for a longer time, we don't have any new infections. I think that's really the, 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 the number to watch out for is the new infections. And I think China is doing well at this point. However, they're still under some social distancing, um, you know, uh, 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 um, lockdown uh, at, or stay at home measures. And so this is going to be um, very important to watch what happens when this is now loosened and when people go back to their normal life and how contained the virus really is. Um, because uh, if it still is spreading in the low grade asymptomatically in the community, uh, then it will come back for sure, unless we have a vaccine or we have a um, a, a way to um, to induce immunity or monitor immunity in the community and, and selectively let people um, go to the forefront when they are immune. But I wanted to say something about the testing. I think we, yes, I think testing is an immediate um, urgent task currently for the scientific community, not only to in, in, enhance the current testing, but also to provide new testing. And us at the Gladstone, we're heavily invested in using new CRISPR technology to make, you know, shorter and easier tests that can be delivered and done at home, not only, um, you know, you know, delivered to your home and then picked up again, but you can actually do it at home and could be, um, you know, you could easily read it out with an iPhone or a mobile phone and that that would also help with you know, public health measures to, to, to locate where the infections are and, and immediately uh, inform people around um, that particular um, case to make sure that we have selective social distancing in place. So I think there's a lot going on currently in that area and that's an immediate need and that 
um, should receive a lot of attention. So right now, I mean, I, my experience in Hong Kong was, I remember when this first, uh, it, it, the, Hong Kong's approach was, and granted, it's a smaller place than the United States, right? It's, it's you know, we're, we're, we're e more easily containable. But I remember the tests coming, the first test took three days and it was a blood test and it was a long waiting period. Um, but now they have a more rapid test. So where are we on that spectrum? I mean, CRISPR would be amazing if you could have something attached to your mobile phone and saying positive, negative, and that to me would be an answer to a lot of this, right? But because if, if it is indeed asymptomatic, like we believe, a lot of people are spreading it without even knowing they have it, right? So yeah. how, how, how long does that take to develop something like that? Well, I think everything, usually it takes quite a long time, but everything is being, uh, you know, moving at an amazing speed currently, just also in part because there's a lot of different factors coming together, um, not only the scientists who, um, you know, develop certain things, but also, you know, the biotech or mobile phone industry, data sharing companies, um, you know, big, uh, big, big players uh, who, who recognize that there is an immediate need and there, there is a lot of help that they can provide in, in terms of making things happening. So we have been extremely grateful for all the you know um, attention and connections that have been made and that will greatly accelerate this um, there's still the need to um, to eventually develop this and and put it into action and um, and that's what we're currently trying to coordinate okay um, we have another question um, from someone um, watching saying I'm a fundraising consultant in the US and I'm working with a regional hospital system to support their philanthropic outcomes They're, they are preparing for COVID-19 what donor centric messages uh, can I share with them to present um, philanthropists so Akila you want to take that that's a great question um, I, I'm having flashbacks to January when hospitals were asking for ventilators. And I remember distinctly going on Google saying, ventilators, like how, how do I describe this to a donor? How, what is it, how, you know, how do I share that need with a, a private donor in the United States? And uh, it was really helpful to have uh, hospitals and nonprofit organizations focus on why it was important, the need of the project, the shortage, and you know, how much it would take to purchase ventilators. Um, and the world was in a different place at that time where there were still ventilators in supply. Uh, so I, I just reached out to donors saying, you know, this is the need, we desperately need X number of, of ventilators and this is the model that is being requested and this is the number that is needed. And once we were able to get that funding through the door, then the next step was to reach out to the nonprofit organizations and the suppliers on the ground to say, okay, where are these ventilators? How can we get, how can we secure them? And that's the, that's the bigger question um, that was uh, more complex and even more complex at this point because it's just a global shortage for them. Uh, but um, I think uh, if we can get past the sourcing issues, then it's, it was a pretty, uh, a pretty compelling conversation to have with a donor. That's a, an easy output. So that part wasn't that difficult. And when it comes to the supplier issues, Melanie had um, spoken about this as well. The importance of having public-private partnerships at this time is key. Uh, companies are, corporations, companies have um, expertise in areas that nonprofits don't. And to have them to be able to share uh, pro, on a pro bono basis um, information on supply chains, distributions, how do you get medical equipment, all of that comes into place. And when we were going through this in Wuhan, we were certainly talking to companies and to, to distributors and, and supply chain folks to figure out how do we get these big machines into the building. Um, so that that is key, managing both. Uh, Melanie, talk to us a little bit about how this virus um, invades our bodies. I mean, the, the, the ventilator is has been described as really life or death. Um, is, that, is that mainly for people who have pre-existing problems or could anybody really face, I mean, the, the virus, you know, it starts out quite mild and then it suddenly attacks your lungs. So tell us a little bit about what we know about how 
it attacks our bodies and, and makes us more vulnerable. Yes, absolutely. I will do that. Before, I wanted to just give kudos to Akila. What she did there in China is really exactly what we need now here because we are exactly at the same place. I mean, there's protective equipment needed everywhere at the front line in the medical and in, in the hospitals, but also in the laboratories because we're running out of them as well because we cannot, we of course don't want to take them away from the clinic. But uh, if we don't have it, we can also not work with them. So we have currently actually very intense interactions with China, with our colleagues there to see how we can, you know, coordinate this the best to, um, to, to make this happen so that at least some level of research can go on with the virus here. So actually going to China and asking for protective, can you help us get more protective? Exactly equipment? what was happening before two months ago is now happening the other way around. And again, talking about the amazing collaborations that are ongoing and the synergies is really, you know, um, faculty member who are from China, from Gladstone are reaching out to their contacts in China to see, um, you know, what is needed, but also what can can they provide and 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 um, and the same thing is is happening you know on the other side so I think um, these are amazing uh, connections and they really uh, they really show how how everybody's coming together to try to make to make it happen yeah. now regarding the virus it is a respiratory um, infectious agent that means it enters your body through the lung you inhale it um, you know or you put it you know via droplets um, that, that get contact to your hands or, or somehow through surfaces. Um, you, you, you mainly get it through the respiratory tract where it infects, um, you know, the epithelial cells in the airway and, in, you know, and, and, and other cells in your lung. And that, that is the target of the virus. And that, um, that makes the virus enter these cells and reprogram these cells and make the virus make more virus. Otherwise, the virus cannot survive. It needs this target. It needs us to survive, basically. It can only survive a certain time alone. Uh, so that makes it vulnerable. But also when it gets into the host, it causes a lot of damage. And that's what you know makes the need for the ventilator eventually. It also alarms our immune system very strongly that something is wrong. And then depending on the strength of our immune system, we will you know, fight it very hard maybe sufficiently to get rid of it, or we fight it a little weaker, um, then we don't get rid of it, or we fight it too hard, um, and then we have an over-response, um, and that is usually what causes the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, so it, 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 it comes from every angle. It comes from the virus entering and replicating um, from you know taking function from the lung away because it's dedicated to the virus, but it also comes from the immune system that uh, senses that something is wrong and uh, and and puts up all you know all its efforts to get rid of it. But sometimes it goes too far, and then um, and that that leads to a um, you know to an overreaction and to a disease also. And, um, and so the ventilator is coming in when the lung function is really, it's basically a pneumonia that is developing and a lung infection um, with the associated changes in the lung tissue around it. Um, and it depends very much on your pre-existing lung function, um, how well you can cope with it. Uh, but it also, it, it, it depends on your individual response and that's very hard to predict. Um, on how you, whether you find the right measure of defense or you find too little or you too much. And I think that's what we're currently um, seeing. So therapeutic efforts are, are really targeted towards the virus. Um, and classically, we're trying to block the virus directly with some uh, agent and, and that has worked well for HIV and hepatitis C um, and is currently used very heavily. Um, we're also trying to target the host response um, to, to, to starve off the virus of its necessary environment so that it is um, not able to, um, to, uh, to replicate. And actually my colleague Nevin Krogan just published a paper on the weekend showing all of the viral, uh, the host proteins that are interacting with viral proteins. And that's a treasure trove for finding potential new therapies to shut down the virus. And then the other, the third line is to really go against the immune response um, and in, in some ironic way, you want to dampen it when it's too strong. 
Um, so a lot of the um, anti-inflammatory measures are, are being tested currently. But the key with a ventilator is that when you go into this uh, state that, you, that your lung function is not sufficient to, to sustain oxygenation of your blood, um, you have to um, you have to sort of temporarily bridge this um, with a ventilator, and that's uh, and that's why it's so important to have a, a enough enough of them. So it, what's interesting when I hear you speak about this is like you know I guess if you have comorbidities or some you know if you're a smoker or you're more high at risk, um, but it sounds like even he healthy people their immune systems can be overreactive and therefore they don't respond well. Uh, uh, to the progression of this disease, is that uh, this virus? It's an individual, um, you know, it's a, an individual case by case, and we have heard that you know healthy people have middle aged or young have um, you know have have gotten sick very severely, and uh, and um, and these are all parameters that have to be looked at, and um, and actually with our model with the little lung organoids, since we're getting them from different people, we can actually and we have started to model the different genomic backgrounds that could influence the, um, the response to the virus, but also the question whether we can model the, the, the difference between old and young uh, that seems to be very obvious um, in this virus. So you're, you're actually, tell us a little bit more about that. You are actually growing lungs in, um, in a Petri dish, is that right? And yes. so specifically with your research, what are you looking to to change um, within in that that organoid. So I think the organoid has, as I said, the advantage that it um, that it it is a little bit more complex than other cell culture models, which are usually just composed of one component. But we know that our lung has many components, and uh, many of them are represented in these more complex um, systems like the organoids. So what we can learn, and when we combine this with very complicated technology, where we sequence basically the transcriptome of every single individual cell in our organoid, like three thousand. 6,000 cells, um, and we, we get basically the whole genome or the whole gene expression profile of each of them. We can then compare the cells um, based on what cells they are, and we can see whether they are infected, and we can see what the infection are in this cell is doing to the cell individually. So we have an, an amazing uh, ability now to really look at the single cell level um, what a, how a cell reacts to an infection. But we're not only looking at the infected cells in an organoid, because not every cell is being infected if we give a dose of virus. It will be only a, a small part, part of it. We can also look at the surrounding cells and can see what are they mounting to not get infected. And so we are interested in not only looking into the infected cell and see what are they doing or what are they missing that makes them infected and how is the virus reprogrammed reprogramming the cell for its own good. We're also looking at the neighboring cells to find out how can they protect themselves. And, and that response is important because that tells us what we can do to probably prevent infection from the beginning. Tell us, I mean, this was obviously a, a pivot for research, right? I mean, no one knew about this virus before it descended upon Wuhan. So how quickly can you mobilize? I mean, it, it's, it sounds like you rolled up your sleeves and got right to it um, with collaboration with China. Um, how, t tell, talk us a little bit through the scientific research landscape. How hard or difficult is it to do that, to really pivot? I mean. Yeah, I assume you're working on something else before, and now it's all about about this virus, so yes. about COVID-19. How does that work? Um, where do you get the funding for that? Um, just that's give us a, a little good, bit of insight. That's a very good question, um, because yes, we, we are funded to do certain research, and coronavirus uh, or co SARS-CoV-2 is not one of this, because no nobody has applied for funding for this. Um, so I think you pivot um, because of necessity and because of ability. Um, and you just um, take every, you know, every every dollar you have and put it behind this, basically, um, because it's important. But it only gets you as far because you only have, you know, a certain amount of unrestricted funds that you can devote to it. And actually, Gladstone um, is a, is unique because it gives us a uh, a yearly unrestricted fund that we can use for high risk uh, projects without, you know, applying for for funding at NIH. 
Um, and so you pivot, you do it, and you 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 ask for forgiveness afterwards, basically. But uh, but I think it only gets you you know to a certain point, and then you need to you need to get the funding for it. And I think here is where um, philanthropy can really make a huge difference in this disease, particularly because yes, the NIH and all the foundations and um, and um, you know other governmental organizations they are trying to accommodate their lengthy administrative uh, apparatus to accommodating, you know, grants fast, but it still takes a few months um, and a lot of writing to, um, to get them through the system and, um, and then to compete and to get, um, you know, the money that you need. So I think currently we're basically um, juggling with what we have and, and trying to go as far as possible. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting um, point, too. Who's going to pay for all of this? You know, and scientific funding, no offense, is not fast at doing things um, in, in the normal scheme of things. So it's wonderful that you had um, a fund that Gladstone had the foresight to really have this fund for, for exactly um, reasons like this. Um, could, I, could I add to that? Really yes, quickly? please. Um, I think Melanie brings up a good point. I think private foundations, private philanthropy has the ability to move quickly. Um, we've been seeing that on the disaster you know, relief side, the emergency side, funding for um, you know, uh, viruses and, and um, finding solutions is critical and the speed is just critical. And when it comes to government funding as well as any other you know, institutional foundations, it tends to move a little slower. Um, so I think you know, this webinar specifically is targeted towards those that are in the private donation, private foundation world. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to highlight that I think in times of crisis, speed is critical. Oftentimes private donors have the ability to mobilize faster and it has the ability to take risks and fill in gaps in ways that institutional donors can't. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, um, we were able to see donors that were funding uh, institutions like Gladstone in other countries, but then also emerging basic necessities. Um, and then also taking risk in terms of, you know, we had one donor funding a mapping, you know, exercise to see where the virus was. Like information like that is is really, really critical, oftentimes un unmet um, and private donors can step in. There's a good question as a follow-up to that, um, which I could understand. Um, there's so many opportunities. I mean, there's so much need, right, for donors, um, so many opportunities for donors to choose from and so much need out there. So how do you prioritize? How do donors prioritize um, what they give to and what will, I mean, you know, is there an organized timeline for this in terms of tackling this disease in an organized way? Or is it just kind of a free for all, like just help this, 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 you know, how do you approach that? I think that's a good question. I think Melanie might have another perspective. I can share my perspective. It really goes back to those three phases that I was telling you about. Like the first phase for this virus we've seen in Wuhan, we're seeing it in other countries, is first and foremost, just figure out how to contain the virus. Once you're able to contain it, then you can you know, lift your head up and say, okay, what are the other needs out there? Um, and then start addressing some of the other needs. Um, but uh, what that, containing that virus looks like is is different for different stakeholders in different communities. Um, you know, it's either helping the frontline health workers or it's helping folks like Melanie make sure that we have some sort of testing capability, rapid testing capability, of, you know, some sort of solution at the end of the day. So things do have, have to happen simultaneously, but you do have to address the situation where it is and it's evolving so quickly. Do you take um, money from donors and are, is it only, um, Give to Asia is only Asia? Are you only um, allocating resources to Asia, is that right? We are. Um, so initially we were only fundraising for Wuhan when it comes to this COVID-19 coronavirus and now we have expanded our fundraising and our efforts to um, other countries with weaker health systems. So we are supporting nonprofits in India, uh, the Philippines, Japan, um, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, those are all coming up now. We have another question um, for Melanie. Um, according to the CDC, the recovery rate is much less in the United States than that of China and other countries. 
what does this mean? Does this signify factors for our ability to recover uh, from the disease? Good question. Yeah, very good question. I think it's probably currently skewed because of our lack of testing. A formally recovered is only somebody who has two consecutive negative tests. And right now we don't have tests for anybody to be tested positive or to sufficient tests to, to, for, for people who need to be diagnosed. So I think the testing for the recovery is not prioritized. Um, and I suspect that this is the reason why we're seeing these low numbers because it's just a, a recording um, uh, uh, a recording part of it. Um, but also, I think I think what we're learning in general, and I think that's an important message, um, is that we have to take that virus serious. I think um, in terms of also if you are young and don't have any pre-existing conditions, I think it is unpredictable how you will react to it. Um, and um, and I think we're seeing that even cases that have you know that don't require hospitalization um, have quite a bit of lung damage and take quite a bit of time to recover. So I think if you talk about the recovery rate in terms of the lung function, and that's not different in China or anywhere else in the world, um, I think it takes longer than I think a lot of people anticipate to be fully back to normal. And, um, and so it is really important to be very careful in, in, in the prevention part. Absolutely. I was listening to an um, interview with an Italian reporter who said that actually the label of kind of an old person's virus was hurting the cause because it meant that young people felt like they were invincible and they were actually spreading it everywhere. And so that did them a lot of, um, you know, it really set the clock back for them um, because of this label of an old person's um, virus, which, yeah. you know, anyone's vulnerable to it, as you just it's said. A, it's a misconception. And I think uh, currently we have about 50% of people in the, in the ICU and in America being below 60. So it's not really um, an old people disease. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, elderly have a higher risk of um, fatality and severe disease, but, uh, but it does in no way means that if you're younger and in good shape, that it will not do the same to you. Um, another question is in terms of what other, um, what other promising shovel ready projects should we know about at Gladstone and, and elsewhere? So, you know, um, with research, obviously there's a longer timeline, but what, what needs to happen now in order to speed up um, the, the, the timeline of, of getting to finding a, a vaccine or a cure? Yes, very good question. I think we at Gladstone, we have uh, prioritized that we need to have a safe environment to actually work with the virus. So currently a lot of people work with pieces of the virus because working with the virus itself is extremely dangerous, um, as you know, and, uh, and requires protection, uh, respirators, uh, protective suits. Um, and so we have, um, you know, dedicated, we have two high uh, biosafety containment uh, laboratories in the, inst in the institute and one is currently dedicated exclusively for the use of, um, uh, uh, of COVID-19 research, both for cell culture and for animals, because I think that's the next step, especially if you talk about promising, um, you know, therapeutic targets or um, drugs or vaccines, I think animal models will be absolutely key to, to testing this in a, in a safe way. So I think, um, I think this is our priority or one of our priorities. I think we have, as I said, we have a lot of able uh, virologists in the Institute, they all have adapted their needs. I think we have um, Warner Green um, working on a specific essay um, where we're just looking at entry of the virus. So that means the receptor binding, you all have heard probably about ACE2 um, as a receptor. And so that can be safely modeled in a non-infectious environment. And, and I think this will be gearing up to high throughput drug screenings in a short time. That also will help with antibody um, um, screenings because antibodies from recovered people um, that have basically neutralizing activity against the virus can be used um, to, to pre prevent or treat severe disease in, in others. And that's one of the immediate um, sort of uh, avenues that can be followed, uh, identifying these antibodies, cloning them and, uh, and, and, and providing them in, 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 an, in a safe environment so that, that people can be treated with it. So that's, that has been done with other viruses and it works uh, hopefully with this virus also. Um, 
We are also, as I said, my colleague Nevin Krogan, he has worked on the, the interactome of these um, viral proteins. So he has looked at all of the host factors that would particularly contact a viral protein in a cell as a potential therapeutic target. And, uh, and they have made predictions of what approved drugs are already could immediately be repurposed for, uh, for therapies. And that's, that's what we're currently testing in the, in the, in the virology um, environment. And, uh, and then we also have a, my colleague, Leo Weinberger, he has a very interesting approach. He basically uses mini viruses to starve out big viruses as a prevention tool. Um, and so he's working on this so-called TIPS technology to, uh, to, to adapt this to, um, to this new coronavirus challenge. And, um, and Nadia Rowan in the lab and in the Institute, she is really looking at the immune response and trying to identify these specific antibodies that, um, that, can, be, that can be potentially isolated and, 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 and used in a, large, in a larger format as a treatment. So there's a lot of uh, very comprehensive front of, 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 of projects that we have lined up. And, and the good thing is that we are a very tight knit community. So we share everything, uh, every knowledge, every reagent, um, every machine. And so this um, can you know, really progress in an unprecedented speed, at least in our institute. And I'm sure at every other institution, we work very closely with UCSF and all of the Bay Area um, you know, institutions. I think we are, we're forming a little bit of a hub function currently because we, we're building up the virology capability and hope to you know give it to or to give access to many of our colleagues in the in the future to accelerate their research and so there's currently really a big neck networking going on where where we're trying to coordinate and, and trying to make priorities and and put the best people on the most promising um, projects yeah and, and what you said really resonates the the most simplistic of problems just protective gear right is what's needed immediately and to see how um that is actually impacting uh, research because you can't actually get the protective equipment to study the virus is just that's a huge problem that needs to be solved and could be solved um quickly uh should should a donor step in and and locate the resources yes i think that would be amazing yeah, and, and make a huge impact. I mean, the breadth and the scope of what you just said is going on at Gladstone is just eye-popping. I mean, really kudos to you. That's just amazing what's what's happening so quickly. Um, what about, um, Akila? what about shovel ready for you? What would you say um, is, is shovel ready? So what's keeping me up at night is the idea of this virus spreading to dense populations in other countries in Asia. That's what's keeping me up at night. And the idea of uh, finding ways to contain the virus in places like India, in Bangladesh, in Nepal, the Philippines, these are communities with very, very dense populations, weaker health systems, um, uh, weaker abilities to contain their populations um, and disseminate information and awareness. And for me, and for Give to Asia, it's a priority to try to figure out how to get funding to public health institutions in those countries so that we can spread awareness uh, and build their capacities to contain this virus. Absolutely. And as we saw here, um, and just to use this, the, the smaller example of Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong actually succeeded in getting ahead of the virus by testing everybody incessantly. Um, anyone who had, you know, a little cough or a fever and showed up at the doctors before they actually knew they would isolate them, test them, make sure it wasn't COVID-19. Um, and it worked. It truly worked. Um, so, I mean, it is daunting to think about populations like India, um, Bangladesh, where people live in such closed quarters um, next to each other, on top of each other. Um, the potential there um, is just daunting. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and I think with that, um, we've, we've covered a lot of information. This obviously will be available um, online. Actually, um, Akila, maybe you want to tell people if they want to send this, um, how, how can they do so? Yeah, sure. So you'll all receive an email with a recording of this uh, webinar. Please do share it with your network, put it on your social media. This is all information that we are hoping to just generate more support overall for very important causes. And we'll be sharing the email addresses for all, all three of us here. So if you have any questions, if you want to discuss anything, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. 
Yeah, and it's really wonderful to, you know, take the politics out and, and really um, concentrate on what's been going on, which is amazing, and, and what more needs to be done. So to you and your work, um, Give to Asia, thank you so much um, for really enlightening us and, and in giving us a glimpse of how powerful philanthropic support could, can be um, in times like this, in times of crisis. And Melanie, um, to you too, thank you so much uh, for all the work that you do, um, to Gladstone um, for coordinating such an incredible effort um, without on a very short timeline. So we all, um, as people who potentially could be expo exposed to the virus, are, are grateful for all of your work. Um, thanks very much. Um, that brings the end to the webinar. And um, as Akila mentioned, please send us questions if you have so afterwards. Thanks for watching.